Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today to the, uh, this is, I think, the third out of four uh, sessions for the spring series of the uh, joint Harvard Northeastern uh, Misinformation Speaker Series. So um, before I talk about today's event, I just want to make a quick plug for the last event, which is coming up on May 5th. Uh, we have Rasmus Kleiss Nielsen coming all the way from the UK, virtually. Uh, unfortunately, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, because of the time difference, we're doing that one a little bit earlier at 10.30, so uh, please join us for that. Um, but today, we are really happy to welcome Dana Young, uh, who is a professor of communication and political science and international relations. I'm wondering what you're not a professor of, Dana, because um, uh, that's a lot of different titles, uh, at the University of Delaware. Um, there she studies uh, co the content, audience, and effects of non-traditional political information. She's offered, authored over 40 academic articles and book chapters uh, exploring themes related to political entertainment, uh, the psychology of media, public opinion, and misinformation. She's also uh, author of the 2019 book, Irony and Outrage. And currently she's working on a book exploring how identity fuels misinformation and how our socially sorted political media ecosystem reinforces those patterns. She is a uh, frequent media commentator and also a TED speaker. Um, today, she's gonna talk to us uh, about epistemic motivations, political identity, and misperceptions about COVID in the 2020 election. Uh, Dana, the floor is yours. Um, when we get to Q&A, uh, I would ask people to, you can either write the questions down or sorry, the floor wasn't quite yours yet, but it will be in a second. Oh. Uh, or uh, just raise your hand and we'll call on you. And we'll go back and forth between live and uh, the chat. So I'm sorry, now the floor really is yours. Okay, so now, okay. So pretend that you didn't see that until just now. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm super excited to talk to you all today and get some feedback on this project that I'm working on. Um, I've been working with Aaron Maloney, who's here. Hi, Aaron. Um, at the University of Delaware on a larger project, which I will explain. Um, but just sort of so, for some background and context on the, the questions that I'm looking at here. Um, in my new book is Wrong, How Identity Fuels Misinformation and How to Fix It. And what I'm hoping to do in this book is to help shift the conversation about mis and disinformation a bit away from that supply side, right? Content moderation and account suspension which is important, obviously, but which cannot alone fix this problem that we're facing right now. So I'm gonna shift the conversation a bit to the demand side of the equation. And that means understanding the demand for false narratives because people actually are seeking them out and they want them. So how do we curb that? Um, so that brings me to questions like, or, or um, assertions such as, how we think of ourselves shapes what we want to believe to be true. So we have emotional, psychological, and social needs that shape our perception of reality and how we think about and perform the role of someone from within our social category. Uh, but not only are these social roles socially constructed, there are actual psychological differences between, for example, liberals and conservatives that political psychologists have been studying for decades. So a lot of these distinctions come uh, between social and cultural liberals and conservatives, which I'll talk about today. Um, and these differences create a sort of asymmetry in how we have to think about what's driving demand for false information in our current political and media environment. So that asymmetry is something that we're unpacking in this um, empirical examination here today. So for the roadmap, um, first, we'll talk very briefly about misinformation and misperceptions. There is misinformation and people hold misperceptions. Um, next, I'm going to talk about epistemic motivations, what they are and what that term means and what we know about them. Talk very briefly about political psychology and some of the important substantive differences that exist between the left and the right. Political identity, which is something that I, I'd like feedback on a bit because we're, we're thinking about different ways to conceptualize and operationalize political identity here. Run through our main hypotheses and then our early findings. So this slide 
This is all I need to say, I think, about misinformation and misperceptions. This is a speaker series dedicated to misinformation, so suffice it to say, there is a lot of misinformation out there. And a lot of it is affecting both public health and democratic health. Um, between COVID and the insurrection, I don't think I need to spend too much time talking about the nature of the misinformation environment and the fact that people hold these misperceptions. Um, in terms of the ones that we actually measure, I will get into those in a bit. So when we're talking about epistemic beliefs, we're, we actually are gonna talk about epistemic motivations, but I'm gonna talk a bit about the concept of epistemic beliefs, which is how it's been referred to in the literature. Um, these are beliefs about the source of knowledge, beliefs about the ease with which knowledge is obtained and how certain knowledge is. Is knowledge easy? Is it available? Is it accessible? Is it stable? Does it change over time? Is knowledge socially constructed? But also beliefs about where knowledge originates. Um, does it come from one's gut? Does it come from experience? Does it come from personal experience? Or does it come from experts? Does it come from evidence and data? So some of the distinctions that are useful here are between um, intuition versus rational thinking. This distinction was really um, explored early on by Epstein and colleagues, and Kahneman kind of solidified the, this distinction with you know, thinking fast, thinking slow, system one versus system two thinking. One of these systems is rooted in intuition and instinct, and the other is rooted in analysis and logic and rational thought. Um, what's, what's key about these two systems is that they are separate and they do operate simultaneously and people might um, value one over the other. When, when Aaron and I were working on this, we had a lot of conversations about how to refer to these, to these propensities because we're not actually doing fMRI research or measuring even um, cognitive reflection. So we can't talk about what um, method of thinking people are actually engaging in. The measures that we have are about sort of self-reported inclinations to tap into either instinct or to use evidence to come to truth. And so we've decided that we're really gonna think about this in terms of the value that people place on one kind of thinking over another. Again, because we can't actually tap into what kind of thinking they're doing, but just which way of coming to truth do they report valuing more? Are they more motivated to tap into? Um, and this distinction was examined um, in this wonderful book that of course, no, I don't have right here. Um, in Enchanted America, Oliver and Wood talk about this, this distinction between intuitionists and rationalists and how it's increasingly mapping onto our uh, political landscape in the United States. And I will get into that as well. So the reason that epistemic beliefs and epistemic motivations are so important in the context of conversations about myths and disinformation is because there is evidence that system one thinking does lend itself to more susceptibility to myths and disinformation than system two thinking. So intuitive thinking is linked to this greater susceptibility compared to more analytical, rational thinking. Um, Kelly Garrett and Brian Weeks had a great study in 2017 that really start, started to put this together. And of course, Gordon Pennycook and David Rand, their work suggests that, you know, when you, when, if you give someone a, a cue to think in terms of accuracy, you can actually make them less susceptible to mis- and disinformation, perhaps by encouraging them to tap into a more rational, logical system of coming to understanding, coming to knowledge. Um, okay, so next up, we have to think about, okay, so I have two slides here that are summarizing like books upon books of work. So I'm gonna try to do it fast. Um, we know from decades of work uh, from political psychology that there are these distinct uh, psychological traits that exist between social and cultural liberals and conservatives. And this creates this asymmetry in the kinds of needs and urges that shape how people uh, on the left and the right interact with 
orient to and think about their worlds. So all of these really uh, are traits that are linked to how we manage threat and how we manage uncertainty. Traits like tolerance for ambiguity or need for cognition, these are related to people who are low threat monitors, right? On the other hand, need for closure and decision-making rooted in heuristics and efficiency, these tend to be re related to being a high threat monitor. So it follows then that these associations would have implications for the ways in which liberals and conservatives understand their worlds and decide what is true. So linking that literature then to this concept of epistemic motivations, again, is this work by Oliver and Wood, where they're talking about how these, in, these same inclinations that have been you know, found to map onto ideology for a very long time, this notion that conservatives are about efficiency and confident decision-making, relying on heuristics, this speaks to intuition and valuing intuition as a mechanism to come to truth. On the other hand, liberals who are less likely to be monitoring for threat, who then therefore have higher tolerance for ambiguity, higher need for cognition, right? Because they have the luxury of not feeling the urge to have to make a decision efficiency, efficiently or immediately. Liberals then, um, can explore a wider range of options, might be less certain of which path to take, and they then will consult more information and evaluate message arguments more centrally and more carefully than conservatives will. So this maps onto that concept of rationalism, right? Individuals guided more by evidence, data, and analytical thinking. So the, the case that Oliver and Wood make here is that because, and we could talk a bit about um, Lily Mason's work on so, the social sorting of the two political parties in the US, that because of the increased homogeneity within the Democratic Party and within the Republican Party, combined with the fact that the, the Republican Party has become more internally homogenous on the dimensions of race and religion and become more evangelical Christian, there is this strong link now, more so than in the past even, between um, political party and these epistemic motivations. So much so that they argue the most important political division in the US is not between liberals and conservatives or between red and blue, but between rationalists and intuitionists, which are increasingly mapping on to those political identities. So, Detour for one second, because this is something that, again, I'm interested in some feedback on. When we're talking about political identity here, there are different ways that we might conceptualize political identity and operationalize it. Of course, political party, which is a fairly stable trait that's linked to social identity and group categorization, rather than or more so than it's about political issues. Um, historically, political ideology is something that has been thought of also as a stable characteristic, but that's more rooted in people's beliefs about issues and policies. Um, that has been an assumption in the literature. Um, we're, we're exploring here the concept of Trumpism in particular as a unique distillation, like a subgroup, a distillation of social and cultural conservatism. We know from research that racial and cultural resentment and populism fueled the Trump support and the Trump vote. We also know from work by Barbara and Pope that Trump and Trump's cues and what Trump says people should believe or should think, Trump's political ideology in terms of what issues people will support or oppose. So if people are told that Trump supports something, even if that thing is socially or culturally liberal, his supporters will support it because he supports it. Uh, it's also to note in terms of this distillation that Trumpism is popular among non-college educated whites. So thinking about um, social and racial homogeneity and also what accompanies a lower level of education, which is 
um, lower likelihood of central message processing, more reliance on heuristic cues. So again, it's like a distillation of what we already know is part and parcel of social and cultural conservatism. So folks will say, well, but aren't, isn't the Republican Party the party of Donald Trump? Um, increasingly, it does seem that perhaps that's the case, although, you know, Trump supporters and the Republican Party does not a complete circle make. <laughs> um, some of this, the, the more recent data from February suggests that, you know, there's about a third of the Republican Party that is ready to <laughs> detach that wagon from their horse. Did I say that right? Detach them or the horse from the wagon, whatever. So Republicans were asked is, if Trump formed his own party, would you join it? 30% of Republicans said no. And when it came to the question about the second impeachment vote, when asked, um, are those in the party who vote to impeach or, or convict Trump disloyal or principled? Again, almost 30% saying principled. So the way I think about it, and this is not to scale, this is just an illustration that the loyal Trump supporters are this sort of more condensed version a distilled version um, of this social and cultural dimension within the Republican Party. Okay. Trumpism is also unique because of Donald Trump himself. Literally, Donald Trump said, I have a gut and my gut tells me more sometimes than anybody else's brain can ever tell me. If this is not intuitively motivated thinking, I don't know what is. Um, so again, we're talking about this as a, as a unique distillation of social and cultural conservatism. Um, it's rooted in populism. Also recognize, you know, from the moment that Trump announced his candidacy in, in 2015, it was framed in terms of illegal immigration, the need for a Muslim ban, the need to build a wall. So tapping into racial and cultural resentments. And rooted directly in populism, as described as this opposition between the pure people versus the corrupt elite. So his calls to drain the swamp were compatible with, with that. So what are the implications of Trumpism for epistemic beliefs or epistemic motivations? We suggest that because of its focus on social and cultural ideology in particular, and because of the spirit of populism in his rhetoric, and because of the way that he talks about how he comes to truth himself, perhaps we should start thinking about how Trump supporters will ascribe less value to knowledge obtained through experts and evidence and more value to knowledge obtained through instinct and emotions. Okay, so that's my roadmap. So the hypotheses here that we're looking at, um, number one, epistemic motivations will correlate with party and ideology, with Republicans and conservatives scoring higher in intuition and feeling-based motivations and lower in evidence-based motivations. Um, and we, are, we suggest that this relationship should be even more pronounced when we operationalize it as Trumpism. And the Trumpism construct that we're using is a 10-point favorability of Trump minus the 10 point favorability of Joe Biden. So it's not just how much you love Donald Trump, but how loyal you are to Trump and how, how much you oppose or have negative affect towards Biden. Uh, number two, epistemic motivations will correlate with misperceptions about COVID and the election. So this is a direct extension of the work of um, Garrett and Weeks and Penny Cook and Rand that integrate that epistemic belief system into um, analyses of mis misperceptions and misinformation. And here we suggest that this relationship, uh, oh, sorry, there's another thing missing here. We suggest that there's gonna be this link between um, political identity and misperceptions as well. And that that relationship will be most pronounced when political identity is operationalized as Trumpism. And finally, is a mediation analysis to understand if we could think about Trumpism as a sort of conduit or a mediator or partial mediator through which 
these epistemic motivations then contribute to misinformation, um, both in the context of COVID and the election. Okay. So let me run through how we did this. So first, this, this project is part of a much larger uh, project. Um, Amy Blakely, who I think might be here too, um, Amy Blakely, it has put together uh, a large project uh, funded by the National Institute of Aging. And it's really to look at the extent to which uh, COVID and media coverage of COVID affect people's willingness to participate in medical research, particularly in the context of Alzheimer's research. So there's a, a much larger project that this is a part of. Um, the survey that we're looking at here is administered by SSRS. And the data we're looking at is from two ways. It's a longitudinal survey, so before and after the election. And our retention rate at wave two after the election was about 52%. Important details about the sample because it is a unique kind of sample. First, we have um, two separate age groups that are sampled. We have 18 to 49 year olds, and then we have a much larger sample of 50 plus, because again, the goal of the larger project is to look at um, people's willingness to engage in research related to Alzheimer's. There are also oversamples of racial and ethnic minority categories to be able to make comparisons in other research, not the research we're doing here, um, between racial and ethnic categories. So because of that, there are um, weights that have to be applied within each sample separately. Um, okay, I think that that is it. I think that's it. If you have questions about that, I can answer them, or hopefully, even better, Aaron could answer them. So when we're talking about these epistemic motivations, we have two scales we're looking at. And again, remember, I'm not talking about how people do come to truth. I'm talking about how they value different ways of coming to truth. Because again, these are self-reported items. So these are, uh, how much do you agree or disagree? I trust my gut to tell me what's true. Trust my initial feelings about the facts. Um, very reliable scale in both samples. When it comes to the evidence scale, things like evidence is more important than whether something feels true, a hunch needs to be confirmed with data. I trust the facts, not just my instincts, etc. cetera. Um, again, very reliable scale. Reminder that intuitive and evidence-based thinking and these sets of motivations are two unique systems, okay? They are not opposite ends of a bipolar scale. And in fact, our early analysis showed that that is true. People can be low in both, they can be high in both, or they can show a preference for one kind of thinking over another. The two scales, interestingly, are positively correlated. So thinking of them as bipolar opposites, that does not make sense. These are positively correlated. So to start off here, we wanted to first understand um, the relationship between our different political identity constructs to see what those relationships look like. So these are simple bivariate correlations within each sample between Trumpism, ideology, and party, um, just to see what we're dealing with. Um, we wanted to figure out, first of all, are, you know, to what extent are these things related? Are they measuring the same thing? Because if they are, then the whole piece about Trumpism being a distillation doesn't make sense. Um, but they are distinct. Obviously, they are strongly related, especially Trumpism and party, but they are not all capturing exactly the same thing. Um, okay. Next up is understanding to what extent epistemic motivations are related to each of these political identities. So here, these are um, these are analyses conducted through maximum likelihood mean variance adjusted regression, which is an estimation method that allows for us to use all the data that we have from waves one and two but to adjust for the missing data that exists in wave two. So th these tables here and in the other um, regressions I'll show uh, are unstandardized coefficients and the robust standard errors are in parentheses. So what's most interesting to us is that in all of these cases, EPIS, it, it is a rejection of 
epistemic evidence-based motivations that seems to be predictive of the conservative end of the measure, right? So it's a rejection of evidence-based thought that predicts conservatism, a rejection of evidence-based thought that predicts being a Republican, and a rejection of evidence-based thought that predicts Trumpism. And the one thing that I think might be worth looking at here is that the R square, these R squares are tiny, of course, but especially in the older sample uh, for Trumpism, that R square we think is interesting. That like, yes, there's definitely something going on here. And notice here too, in the older sample, when it comes to Trumpism, Trumpism is a combination both of a rejection of evidence-based thinking and embracing intuition and instinct as a way to get to truth. Okay, so now on to the question of misperceptions. We have two different scales of misperceptions. One are election-based misperceptions. Um, the second is COVID-based misperceptions. I, I'm not gonna go through all of these because I, I don't wanna stress Matt out and talk for more than 40 minutes. So suffice it to say, these are probably what you think they are. With COVID misperceptions, we have obviously COVID as a hoax, the flu is more lethal than COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, again, a highly reliable scale in both samples. Um, I can return to these in the Q&A if you have questions about these measures. So the next step is, to what extent are COVID misperceptions correlated with these different political identity measures? Well, goodness me, that is where Trumpism is definitely interesting. If you look at these correlations, you can see, yes, of course, we find that conservatives are more likely to hold these misperceptions than liberals. We, are, we also find that Republicans are more likely to hold these misperceptions than Democrats. And obviously these correlations are much stronger in the context of the election misperceptions, which are overtly political. Um, but it's in the context of Trumpism in particular where these correlations are the strongest. That's interesting. Um, so next up are hypotheses 2 and 2A, right, where we're going to be using the epistemic motivations to predict COVID misperceptions and then add, at this point now, we're leaving party and ideology aside. We're just going with Trumpism because it is the strongest predictor of misperceptions has the strongest correlation with misperceptions compared to party and ideology. And goodness me, we cannot include all three in the models or it would explode. So predicting COVID misperceptions, look at this. In both age groups, epistemic motivations linked to intuition and feelings are positively predicting COVID misperceptions and evidence-based motivations are negatively predicting COVID misperceptions in both. Now, notice in each of these samples, this the second column here, I think you can see my mouse. First of all, holy Hannah, the R squared jumps way up as soon as you put Trump in there. So Trumpism itself seems to be pulling some of the strength of these unstandardized coefficients down. So the next question, of course, is, okay, is Trumpism partially responsible for these linkages between these epistemic motivations and these misperceptions? Is, could that be what's going on here? So that's where we do the mediation analysis, which I'll show in a second. But you think these are squares or something. Wait until you see the election misperceptions predicted through epistemic motivations in Trumpism. My goodness. Okay, so the similar findings, right? The patterns are similar. Um, valuing intuition and instinct as a way to truth, you hold more election misperceptions. Um, valuing evidence and data and experts as a way to truth leads you to have lower election misperceptions. And again, when Trumpism is added to, the, to these models, it appears that these coefficients shrink. So is that an aberration or is that actually happening or is it a mirage? So 
What we've done so far, just to recap, and then I'll show you the mediation, okay? Hold on. This is what we've done, right? This is what we've been looking at is the extent to which epistemic beliefs rooted in feelings and intuition positively contribute to misperceptions, while evidence-based motivations negatively contribute to misperceptions. So what we want to understand here is to what extent this is happening through Trumpism, that maybe people who orient to the world in these particular ways are attracted to Trump. He fulfills some needs for them. And he also then, that support also lends itself to further, further holding misperceptions in both of these arenas. So mediation analysis suggests that all of these, in all of these instances, in both age group samples, in the context of both COVID misperceptions and election misperceptions, it is the case that Trumpism is at least a partial mediator of that link between epistemic motivations and misperceptions, okay? Um, especially here in the context of a rejection of evidence, a rejection of evidence goes on to increase Trumpism, which goes on to increase misperceptions, okay? Uh, both in the context of COVID and the election. Obviously, these are stronger. These are larger coefficients in the context of the election, which would make sense because it's so directly tied to political identity. Um, but still, the fact that it holds in the context of COVID is also hugely important. So recap of where we're at and then where we're heading. And then I'd love um, feedback and suggestions. So mo epistemic motivations are correlated with misperceptions, which has already been established in other contexts and it is true here. Epistemic motivations are also correlated with political identity, especially when that political identity is operationalized as Trumpism and also as party misperceptions about COVID and the election are highest among those on the political right, especially when operationalized as Trumpism. Maybe not that shocking, but this is where we're really excited in like a devastated kind of way. Trumpism is serving as this partial mediator of the relationships between epistemic motivations and misperceptions consistent with and this is the story as we're, we're thinking about it, and I'd love some input here. Less reliance on evidence and data and more reliance on intuition and feelings predicts Trumpism, which then fuels misperceptions. Um, so we really want to get at this notion of Trumpism as a manifestation or articulation of epistemic beliefs, but we also want to be able to get at some of this causal order here. Like what is causing what? Because obviously there's a lot of opportunities for like feedback loops happening. So the next step for us is understanding the causal relationships here between these epistemic motivations, um, attraction to Trump, support for Trump, and then Trump coverage, Trump rhetoric, maybe going back in, reinforcing those epistemic mo motivations in the first place. So integrating Mike Slater's reinforcing spirals approach where identity shapes exposure to information in a way that then reinforces the, those um, aspects of one's identity, we think this could really be useful here. We'd love to think about how maybe rhetoric or media coverage could prime epistemic motivations. So prime motivations that are rooted in intuition and are in opposition to evidence-based reasoning. So either through Trump's rhetoric where he says things like, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but I just feel it. It just seems right. I'm, I'm smart. I know these things, you know, um, or, or through conservative media coverage itself. Um, also in terms of the criticism of scientific and medical experts, which comes from Trump a lot. 
Um, we're also, part of this project, the larger project, is a content analysis of media coverage. And included in that content analysis, which is not of the election, by the way, it's just of COVID, but it still would provide a context where we can look at this. Um, we're looking at how experts are framed across newspaper coverage, network news coverage, and cable media outlets. And also descriptions of traditional evidence data and experts, like how are they described positively or negatively? And to what extent does that, um, do those descriptions correlate with outlet? We can then look at um, specific dosage effects. So the content, the results of that content analysis um, run as an interaction term with self-reported exposure measures to the unique outlets themselves to understand to what extent these epistemic motivations might be primed among certain audiences, thereby reinforcing these kinds of patterns that could further fuel misinformation. And um, finally, looking at a way to, to do an experimental ma manipulation for a crucial test of like the internal mechanism that might be at play if there is this sort of priming effect going on. Um, great, so that's it. And how did I do? 1237, Matt. Yeah, you got you got it right under my my stress wire. So oh, good. Are, okay, I I can't have Matt stressing. So that's yeah, that would be bad. Uh, so okay. yeah. so eager to trigger. hear thoughts from folks. Can we go ahead and end the share so I can uh, see people? So um, and real quick, just a reminder: uh, if we can raise your hand, or um, if you prefer, you can write your question in the chat, and I'll uh, go back and forth between the two. So um, let me see if we have any questions. So far, no questions. Good no thing questions. I made you finish early so that we could, we could handle the flood. I know, um, right? My gosh. <laughs> um, well, I just have a, oh, well, David has a question, but he hasn't written it. So I'm going to, yeah, so, oh, here we go. I was about to jump in, but uh, I see a hand raised. Letitia uh, has a question. Yeah, Le Letitia, where are you? Hi, thanks for such Hi. an interesting talk. Um, so I have a question about measuring Trumpism um, mm -hmm. and apologies if, if, if you mentioned this, but to me, a, a particular affinity for Trump is not in relation to your affinity to Biden. It should be in relation to your affinity to other Republicans, um, oh. right? So like above and beyond what you think about Republican leaders in general, what do you think about Trump? Oh, that's really yeah. good. That's smart. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and I don't think that we have that. So I don't think we can do that. So, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Just maybe, maybe thinking more about what it means to like Trump a lot. And, yeah, and yeah, what yeah, is yeah. the, you know, reference group there. Yeah. One of the things we're thinking about right now is that, you know, like Aaron had just said or be, right before the talk that, you know, if we, if we really want to be able to have this as something that's theoretically useful, um, perhaps presenting these findings in terms of party, because it's the same general story, um, rather than linking it specifically to Trump. But I like the idea of this unique moment where Trump captures some kind of id-based thing. Um, yeah, but I don't think we can do that, but that's smart. Uh, what, David, did you want to uh, just ask your question? Yeah, that's what I was. Uh, yeah, uh, so you, you threw me off when you typed. I have a question. I, I, that, I was trying to convey that. Uh, that uh, so um, that that was fabulous, uh, Dad. Th thank you. Um, I, I, my question uh, was simply, uh, if if um, you know you've been focusing on attitudinal outcomes where there's. Um, where the, a lot of the misperceptions tend to be on the right. But let's imagine that if you were asking some questions where there were more misperceptions on the left, like for example, uh, if we were asking around about the 2016 election and saying were the, were the vote totals uh, manipulated uh, somehow uh, in, the, in the close states? Did the, did the Russians change the vote totals? I'm guessing that there would be more misperceptions on the left 
in that regard. And so what, you know, well, if you could run that experiment, um, yeah. uh, you know, what would you anticipate? Because my, my concern mainly is that if you're looking at misperceptions that largely have a left to right gradient, where, where the misperceptions tend to be on the right, we know there are lots of misperceptions that are more prevalent on the left as well, yeah. Yeah. That, um, that what you really may be picking up on are particular, um, um, uh, you know, partisan motivated reasoning um, and yeah. that, that exists just as much on the left uh, as on the right as compared to the, sure. the rational and intuitive thinking, so. I guess, so the way that I think about it is you're absolutely right. And we know, we know that, you know, this sort of intuition-based thinking contributes to conspiratorial ideation on both the left and the right, right? So that it's, it is separate. I guess for me, the larger question is if it is more prevalent on one side than the other, and if it is so highly exploitable to like political ends or towards profit, that's where I feel like we really need to wrestle with it in an asymmetrical way, even if it is uncomfortable to talk about. You know, you're absolutely right that obviously there are liberals who orient to the world through instinct and intuition and from anti-vaxxers to anti-GMO, all of these things, you're right. And the things that we're talking about are completely embedded in a political and cultural moment that makes them, by definition, linked to political party and identity. Um, but I, I guess I feel like that is happening for a reason. You know what I mean? Like that is happening for a reason. Mm -hmm. And even larger analyses of like, you know, you know, the misinformation ecosystem and where it's taking hold and where it's successful and where distribution is so intense. And you look and it's on the far right. And that is a head scratcher. Like at some point you have to say, why is that? Like, what is going on? What are some possible mechanisms to explain why and how that's happening? Okay, well, we've got uh, a few questions in the chat. So uh, let me, uh, it's actually become more than a few. So let me start going down the list. So uh, John Peterson asks, what do we know about how other quote Trumpy political mm -hmm. characters like Josh Hawley or Matt Gates?" Can operate in your model in the place of Trump himself? Is it something unique to him or can it be replicated? Um, great question. I see Trump as, I mean, all of these dynamics are simply the dynamics of a populist leader that uses a uses populist rhetoric towards authoritarian ends. So these are, you know, yes, Trump has. Trump is a, a wonderful version of it because he was able to have this sort of public persona as someone who's this natural born leader and who's super successful and he had name recognition. And um, so perhaps for him, it would be an easier case to make. But in terms of the appeals themselves and tapping into that sort of like folk common sense, I think that it can be successful across the board. Uh, Saul Tenenbaum asks, in 2005, the concept of truthiness, a truth that one knows in one's gut, evidence be damned, is it fair yeah. to describe your finding as documenting the institutionalism of truthiness? Yeah, I don't know. I think that if it were documenting institutional of, uh, in the institutionalism of truthiness, it would have involved a lot more historical analysis. What I would say is it it documents the the sort of um, appeal of truthiness and the inherent partisan nature of truthiness, sort of psychologically. Okay. Uh, Victoria Lavererio, I'm yeah. sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. I wonder whether there has been research about the possible link between religious affiliation and epistemic motivation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that is, is it right here, Deanna? I have it right here. That is Oliver and Wood's entire book. Basically, darn, dang damn it, um, Enchanted America. The, the idea that 
belief in angels and God and ESP and the afterlife are all linked to this sort of intuitionism and intuition-based thinking. Um, I'll just, you didn't ask this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. One of my beefs with some of the research thus far on epistemic motivations, and this may be because of my own biases and background. Um, much of the writing is very condescending to people who are who are motivated to come to truth through, through intuition and instinct. It's very much a normative judgment about coming to truth that way. And you can tell that they're all social scientists who are writing because the idea is like, people who believe in angels are nut jobs, you know? And I'm like, well, tell that to the person who gets a lot of comfort and solace from the belief in angels. Um, perhaps it's highly functional for people to believe in angels. So one of the things I'm wrestling with is a way to approach this from a, um, a less normative stance. Okay, uh, Mark Pizzato says, I'll spare you the compliments you can use. Don't, why spare the compliments? <laughs> Great You're, research, Janet. Great research. What planet are you on, Matt? <laughs> okay. Uh, if rational versus intuitive epist epistemology, uh, epistemology, sorry, uh, is I, apparently I can't read. Uh, and now my screen just shifted. Epistemology is related to left and right uh, cortical networks. Have you considered how other left cortical networks for morality and patriarchal dominance in the work of neuroscientist Ian yeah. McGilchrist, social psychologist yeah. John Tate, or linguist George Lakoff, might relate to the right cortical institute intuitions of Trumpists. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I mean, I think all of this is is linked to you know moral foundations theory. So when you think about the driving concerns of of social liberals versus social conservatives, and you think about um, you know just this the, the intense role played by this perceived threat to white male dominance. Um, in shaping support for Trump, um, I think it's I think it's all related. I also think that it, and this is unrelated to this research here, but there are there's such a huge social dimension to you know support for Trump and you know showing up on January sixth. Um, I'm looking into conflict orientation as it links to Trump support and psychological reactance as it links to Trump support, all of which are about like how you engage with other people who tell you what to do or how you engage with other people who disagree with you. Um, there's a lot of interpersonal stuff going on here, which I also think makes sense given what we know about how liberals and conservatives monitor for threat. And I think that, uh, for a long time, especially because many social scientists are liberal, they thought, okay, well, if people are monitoring for threat and if conservatives are high threat monitors, they're trying to avoid threat. I gotta tell you, I think that assumption is completely wrong. Completely wrong. Maybe conservatives are monitoring for threat so that they can attack the threat, right? Like it seemed, it speaks to me that the, the idea that like, Yes, there would be liberal social scientists who would say, well, the only reason you'd monitor for threat would be to make sure that you avoid it. Well, maybe for you, professor, but maybe not for someone else. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it was fun to think about. Um, how my public health, Matt. Uh, you've uh, are you taking my job now? Yeah. Look, my how my public health people? professionals try to mitigate Trump supporters from a gut antipathy to Dr. Fauci and his advice to stem the pandemic. Yes. How can we soften humanize how he's perceived by Trumpists? Uh, on it, oh, well, there's more. Are we basically stuck with trying to cultivate respect and love? Oh, great. Yeah, that's the reason that I'm reading the questions because. <laughs> okay, fine, you can read the next one. Matt and I go way back if you haven't noticed. Um, so Matt, read the next one. Let me answer this question. I think that because what is driving, again, about this idea of sort of, you know, interpersonal dynamics, because so much of what is driving these patterns has to do with 
feelings of status loss or feelings of threat um, or feelings of being disrespected. It seems that there's a lot of emotional and psychological and social needs that are being served by like Trump, etc. So if you recognize that, this is the same way that, that you have to deal with folks who believe in conspiracy theories, which is if, if it's if belief in conspiracy theories or distrust of Fauci is driven not by information and evidence, but is driven by emotional and psychological and social needs, then the only way that you're going to fix that is by tapping into those same emotional, psychological, and social needs, which means approaching with respect, and love and honoring concerns and recognizing the chaos and recognizing the uncertainty and coming from a standpoint of humility rather than mockery. I mean, these are the, these are the inroads and it sounds trite to say it, but you know, we, we have a lot to learn from our interpersonal communication colleagues. I think poli sci political communication has tended to be very closely linked to studies of mass media. But you know, as those delineations stop making sense, and as all communication is interpersonal, thinking about theories like face negotiation theory, where yeah, if you if you create a face threat for someone, they're going to double down. They're not going to be receptive to your message. Um, yeah. So I don't see another question yet. So I'm just going to. Uh jump in with one of my own uh, real quickly. Um, and this is getting back uh, all the way back to the very first question that uh, Letitia Bodhi raised uh, about the operationalization of um, yeah. uh, Trumpism. As I was looking at that, uh, I was struggling with seeing that as sort of an, an exogenous mediator as opposed yeah. to almost like um, the self-reports being evidence of a moderate tendency and then the uh, support for Trump, you know, the intensity of support, relative support for Trump being kind of a distill, this distillation of that in a stronger yeah. form, in which case you have uh, some and a lot as opposed to yeah. separate sort of dimensions. I'm not sure that I'm right about that, but I'm curious how you think about, uh, you know, this as an exogenous measure, at least as it's operationalized. Yeah, that, that's literally what we're working on right now is trying to figure out, does that even make sense? And, you know, and to Aaron's um, point earlier today about thinking about ways to make this theoretically useful outside of the context of this cultural moment, thinking about social or cultural ideology or thinking about party identification um, might be more useful. I think because it, because of the close connection between our measure of Trumpism and misperceptions, both of COVID and the election, that's where it was like, okay, well, if we, if we want high predictive power, this is where there's a lot of bang for a buck. But you're right in terms of conceptualizing it as an exogenous variable. I think we gotta think a little more about that. Okay, um, there's, a, oh, there's another question now. Uh, Kathleen Bavoso, you touched on it somewhat, but how do you bring someone from intuitive to rational thinking? Um, you know, this is Ben Arsenault's whole book, Taming Intuition, is this very, this very concept. Like, how do we find ways to get people to be more rational in how they think about things? Um, you know, Penny Cook and Rand's work suggests that it's not actually that hard. You just change the goal, the processing goal. You ask, is this true? And all of a sudden people are like, oh, well, I don't think it's true. But the sticky wicket on the end of that is that they still find, even if people know it's not true, sometimes they still say they would share it on social media. In which case, you know, the, the question then is, if people are willing to share something that they know is demonstrably false, then what is motivating their sharing intention? Um, I want to push back a little bit, though, at the premise of that statement. I don't know for sure that we always want to curb intuitive thinking. And I don't know that it's fair to say that rational or evidence-based thinking is always preferred. 
there is a lot of use to operating based on instinct and efficiency and doing so consistently and regularly. And a lot of times it brings people to the right answer. What I see as insidious is the extent to which that inclination is exploited by the conservative media ecosystem in ways that are harmful to democratic and public health, right? Because they can and because it works. So I, I, I would say intuition is not bad on its face. Um, yeah. Can I uh, push on that a little further? Mm -hmm. Do you say that in inherently intuition is somehow inferior to rational thinking? It seems, seems I mean, I thought you made isn't it, isn't it context dependent? Yeah, that's, that's sort of where, where I was going with that because sure. you made a good case for, you know, anything to be exploited. Sure. I uh, think it's context dependent, right? I mean, when we're talking about huge decisions that have um, a lot of consequence and where you have the luxury of time, I, a lot of times rational thinking is normatively preferred. But when, and this is where I think where we've gotten in the, in that, in the far right media bubble is if you convince people that they are under imminent threat interpersonally through people who don't look like them or through, um, you know, fascists who want you to not be able to use the words you want to use. If you make people feel like they're under imminent threat, then their motivation to tap into instinct-based processes is going to be greater, right? Because survival means efficiency rules. Um, and so I think that constant storm of like, you are constantly under threat manufactures threats that are not actually imminent threats to tap into a system that is a useful system when there is a true life or death situation that needs to be faced. Does that make sense, Matt? Makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Uh, Mark Pizzotto, uh, uh, how can we work towards sympathy across uh, dialogue with and rebalancing of left versus right political divides? Wait, where? Solve that, there's a big oh, award. Yeah. Work towards sympathy across dialogue with, yeah. Um, Mark, oh, Mark, that's way above my pay grade. I don't know. I'm working on it, Mark. I don't know. Um, I, I, I guess one of the things that I'm working on is the question of epistemic humility. <laughs> like instead, you know, it's like, this is what I think, but I could be wrong, which is such a more functional and healthy approach in so many cases, and yet is systematically disincentivized by our, by our political and media environment. Right. Imagine if people imagine if somebody was on Fox News and they're like, well, this is what I think is true, Tucker, but I could be wrong. And so I'm not totally sure. It's like, well, then why are you on my show? Um, but I think that that's something that should be valued, that concept. Um, we have time for one more. Uh, and we have one here that's sort of, I don't know, you can decide whether this is a question or a statement that ends with a question mark. Um, Duncan Holloman says, the experience of caring is an integration of the right and left hemisphere is the intuitive, intuitive and rational. How about directing things toward that kind of integration? Yeah. Question mark. Uh, I love it. Yes. Yes. Duncan wins. <laughs> Duncan wins. And I think, he, I think he wins the last question award. I well. think he wins the last question award. I'll just say, ding, you're right. So, uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're at one o'clock, and uh, so we have to stop there. But I want to uh, thank Dana Young for a really terrific talk and uh, Q&A session um, on a fascinating project. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Aaron and I are... are you know, all ears, if you want to shoot an email with any ideas you have. Um, yeah, because this is still in progress. So thank you for this opportunity. It was uh, great. And thanks for the excellent questions. So. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.